recorded April 17th, 2024. Good afternoon, Brody. What's up? What's up? It's 2024? Oh, I got to start changing the dates and putting on my checks. I know, man. Right? <laughs> right? I know. I'm, do- I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good overall. It's busy. Busy, man. Busy. What are you, Running. What are you, you telling, yeah. man? I, um, and I'm more busy. I'm actually taking some PTO to catch up on some things. And, um, and uh, I seem even more busy now. I guess my, when my wife sort of looked at my calendar and realized, oh, you're off and you didn't tell me. You got things to do around here. <laughs> All right. I'm yeah. like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go that route. But no, man, I um, um, been geeking out a little bit, some stuff I wanted to play with in the lab. Um, um, uh, hello, Noodle. Upgraded my Meraki's. It was time for the license to be renewed. It was painless this time. Go figure. Remember, remember it was an entire month worth of show of I couldn't get the Meraki's to work. Oh, yeah, right. I, I remember that. I, I did something that I told you I was going to do. I saved the config before I did anything. Two copies of it. So if anything crapped, I would just run it back and put it back. But this time, That's I, really ever, I documented it right. All right. Put a change right. control in. And uh, he said, did you put grade them up, putting them in the skip? No, I didn't. I actually went ahead and updated it. And I don't skip maintenance on them, Noodle. They said they're going to do it. But since I bought a new security appliance, what I did was, uh, you know, I sort of did. Noodle asked that you put your Meraki's in skip. I said, I, I really sort of did. Because I have two different models of the security appliance. They sometimes can run different firmware levels. Uh, if you want to run them in a high, a pry, and a secondary or high availability, they have to have the same firmware. They can't be out. So I sort of keep it at the lowest one. So if one fails over, it goes to the other. But if you get them too far apart, then they won't they won't fail over. And they actually got a, little, a, a, a cool thing that I added in. We keep having circuit outages here. So what I did was when I'm not traveling with my hotspot, I just turn it on and leave it on and plug it into the back of it. So if it senses that the main fiber connection down, it jumps on the hotspot. And then it'll use that for internet. <laughs> and nice. I'm like, yeah, it's still over. Yeah, I, there's nothing else, man. And um, you're like the uh, smartest sales guy I know. I know, right? I can yeah, sell right. it, and I can install it. And you can, and, and uh, you can lift. You can lift a whole server rack, folks. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> I took the, uh, I did the uh, um, ninja training for Copilot for security and got my little certificate today. Woo-hoo! Yeah. It's a nice looking certificate. I know, Let's right? Pull that up. Where is that? I got it. I got it. Yeah. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to download it so no one can see my teams in the background. I don't get in trouble. <laughs> Noodle says, okay. uh, in the Netherlands, man, when we say put them in the skip, that means the trash. Oh, no, oh. I did not put them in the trash. <laughs> That's good. Okay, let's share a specific screen. Where is it? Stop Here it. Here it is is here is edward can you see that is that working yeah look at that here is edward's certificate of completion great job edward yeah i need i need team. i needed i need a trophy since i uh i feel miserably in my forensic exam but i tell you what Cody, <laughs> thank you so what? much for saying go back and take that exam yet and now that i'm rereading the books they totally read different i mean oh, it's just totally read yeah. different and i'm going well, to intel my- like as you and, and another amazing person in my life, Catherine, um, who I hope listens, we don't know, but uh, she's like, hey, just just take the exam and then you get Intel and then you really know, right? And then you really know and then you can just take it again. And I tell you, man, you, like if you just go the whole summer, this is gone. This is, I don't know about you, I got a goldfish, it's gone, right? Like especially the summer, you're busy outside, yeah. you're you're uh, socializing, right? You yeah. know, you're not, yeah. So like, but I'm taking an hour don't. As I'm reading it now, it is totally. It what am I re, what I'm retaining now is different than than the way I read it and comprehended it. So I'm going through the book. I'm like, hmm, 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 mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Yeah. Go through book one, set it down. So uh, I'll be ready it now, right? You're just like you're just not really not, not really skimming it. It's like I was reading the book. And every other word was incomprehensible because I didn't know the cipher. Now I know the cipher, which is I took the exam. So like you said, you did recon. Now I know the cipher to decode the words that were obfuscated inside the thing. So now I got it, right? Sweet. But but, no, real good. And Frank gave me some good advice. You know, I talked to Frank about it. And he's like, dude, you're good. 
I, he Perfect. took it. He didn't do it. I think a couple of times, and he didn't pass. And he's like, "Man, but did you learn anything?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, learn a lot. A lot of the stuff I put into my lab around logging." And I said, "Man, this is tedious. We write a PowerShell script or write some GPOs that can automatically go in. Like you can go to a customer and say, hey, you know, where your where's your centralized storage? All right, I'm gonna run these GPOs in your environment, and this is gonna turn all these applicable logins that you need to do.'" And, you know, since I love working with MDI, a lot of them affect the way you log with MDI, with uh, Microsoft Defender for Identity, around object access and things like that and group. And so I, I'm like, let me just write this out. So now I'm going to put me a little cheat sheet together. And I suspect places like Microsoft Dart does the same thing, right? When they come in, they're like, hey, we got to do this. But what if you did this in advance? Because when these, po when these folks come to your environment post-breach, I think I said on the show, they burned the first 40, 80 hours worth of work getting your environment ready to be forensic. I made up a word. That nothing's in place. Yeah. Right? And then the people do dumb stuff like turning off the systems. Hey, look at it, who's here. Rod. What's up, Rod? You know what? I'm not a Logic, ten, Logic Tech fan anymore. You know, Rod, I swear it started happening. So for those who are listening, Rod's camera's been weird the last couple episodes. And I swear it started happening when you pushed those buttons to apply filters to your bike audio the other day. Because it was really? fine up until then. And it makes no sense to me mm -hmm. because you've done a reboot and all this jazz. So I don't know. We'll, we'll do some offline diagnosis. But we can see you mostly. You'll just be a little bit lagged. We're on AOL. It's okay. But we can hear you just fine. And that's the important yeah. part. Yeah. Well, you have mail, so. <laughs> they have mail. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, all I did, Brody. What did you do? Second. I know you've been swamped, Brody. What's going on with you, bro? Uh, yeah, well, I'm closing off a project, which is great. We did a big demonstration of, hey, yeah, cheers. I got a, actually an alcohol-free cocktail here. So there we go. Mm -mm. Ah, ooh, margarita. Eh? Ole, margarita. Yeah, right not sponsored. We're not sponsored yet, but maybe ole. Yeah. yeah. This, this nice. right here takes, like, good credit. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that project has been around um, focusing on Microsoft's identity and data zero trust pillars. And we built a demonstration environment for this customer and uh, we're showcasing it and the capabilities and there's a follow on engagement that's, that's focused solely on data. And I think we're laying good groundwork to, to hopefully, you know, be able to keep going and dive deeper into the, into the data sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's wrapping up and just getting ready for the demo. Like, you know, is, I always like nailing it, you know, I like nailing it. So I'm like practicing and I'm making sure I got all my windows ready to go and, mm -hmm. you know, everything's where it needs to be. And I've accounted for shenanigans um, as much as you can do. So that was like a big part of my prep this week. And then I'm also working a lot with Azure policy right now. And I'm, it's like kind of a crash course in Azure policy because they, they brought me on for reasons. Okay. It just made sense for me to do this from a approval standpoint. I'm, I'm trying to be vague. And uh, but I hadn't really like really touched it before. I've just had osmosis uh, learnings through engagements that I'm on, and I'm learning all about the ins and outs of it. And and ultimately, what this customer wants to do is they want to make sure that they have a they can report to auditors against the infrastructure in their environment, and they can they can make sure that, like you know X is compliant or Y is compliant. And it's not just Azure Policy, which is an enforcement engine, but it's also like Defender for Cloud vulnerability management signals and things like that. So it's a lot of cool areas I haven't really touched a lot on in a professional capacity. And I'm learning a lot and I'm learning to read the code pretty quick. And uh, like, for instance, there's some policies that are just, they're just, they're in Azure policy, um, but there's there's nothing to them. And it totally confused us. They're just manual. So that if you look into the code of the policy, it's mm -hmm. like validate vulnerability scans. But like you look into the code, it's just like the, it's just the, the, the shell of the policy. It's like the name. You know, it's not actually checking the vulnerability. It's like, why would you put that in there in the first place? And like, obviously, you, from the Microsoft platform side, at the enterprise level, you would use Defender for Cloud as that kind of vulnerability detection and reporting engine. So I just, so it's like kind of learning, like, why is this even a policy? This isn't the right approach. You know, I consulted on going in a different direction and the team and I came to a good conclusion on that. So it's actually been really intellectually stimulating work because it's been hard. And I've had mm -hmm. to like get into it and I've had little or no background and I kind of work best when I'm under pressure and I have to learn on the fly. So that's, what, that's um, the way we, that's the way we wire. That's how we survive. Those yeah. who do not adapt, get eaten. Uh, it is so funny. You said that I, 
got asked to help out with something because you know I start off it seemed like I started off with everything, but when I came to when I started at Microsoft, I was a CSA. But if you want something, they'll give you a ground reference. And it's just crazy. That I, I was helping out with something today. Go look at Azure landing zones because the landing zone references talk about you know how you have these landing zones around the two major uh zoning uh uh, uh postures which is a uh, platform which is networking compute resource groups platform and the others application whereas you are delivering the application from your tenant as a service to a client not yes yeah. and so when you look at those i went to the git it gives you a lot of references and as you hit deploy it'll throw it into your production and it looks empty just like you said but it sets up the, the way your VNet should be, your way your resource group should be. They should be deployed this manner. This is how uh, key subscriptions of build back to resources that allow you for very detailed cost analysis. So if you just go look at it'll 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 fortify your learning. Go look at landing zones. I will. And I, and I got real interested. Oh my God, this is actually pretty cool. You can build out your entire yeah. your, your 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 tenant operational uh, uh, landscape by deploying these frameworks and the cool part about it um your mileage may vary i'm not saying go do this but when i did it in my lab it didn't affect production it's not invasive now it'll create a lot of empty artifacts that you may have to go clean up right it creates but there is structure. a yeah but there is a way that you can go you know um cloud shell to re, to remove those at bulk too right so there's no big deal right. but check it out all right well, rod that you're finally back is he stuck i can't tell can you can you see me can you hear me at least yeah we can hear you you're like right. uh, every fourth frame gets lagged a bit, but that's okay. Let's 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 see if I can share my screen. I have a couple of things I wanted to share. Number one, let's see if you can see this. Can you see this? Yes. See that screen? Yes. So this is a workshop that I've been working on, and it is in the final stages. I'm delivering it in beta tomorrow for our CCP group, and this is how to develop the golden prompt for copilot for security right so it's uh you can see there it's like 72 slides so far um there are no hands-on at the moment because why why would you guess that um i don't know actually because if we if we suggest that customers do this in their own environment it's going to cost against their svus so they're going to get actually work, yeah we're actually working on a su burn don't say that's a bad word um let We're actually working bit. on uh, a workshop tenant. So uh, budget's been approved for that. So that should come out soon. I'm actually delivering that in beta. The hope for this thing is to actually release it for our internal and external partners to be able to deliver here eventually. So nice. let me let me, let me me give you the technical reviewer, which you should send it by me so I can look over it, and the lawyer perspective on this. Yeah. Good is subjective. <laughs> it is. It should be efficient prompting. Let me try this again. Uh, optimized prompting. All right. Next thing. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh, it'll probably be optimized for all the verbiage eventually. Um, if anyone's interested, I'm actually doing an office hours for on Copilot for Security tomorrow. Afternoon. So tomorrow morning, I'm doing the workshop. Tomorrow afternoon, I'm doing the Microsoft National Office Hours talking about Copilot for Security. Tomorrow, I'll put the link in the show notes and in the chat here shortly, but anyone can join. And if you want to get a look at Copilot for Security, if you don't think you've actually done that here on the show already, then you can do that. Last thing I have is we talked about this last week. I showed my pricing or what I was being charged for my SCU, mm -hmm. my one single SCU. And Last week, you looked in here, and there's literally nothing, no charges. Well, there was a bug in billing for Copilot for Security, and that has been fixed as of yesterday, because yesterday I went in, and sure enough, my billing is up to date. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have my lab up where I can I have a, enough for at least a single SEU, um, yep. but I want to make sure I have time to look at it and not – Turn it on and a Franklin happened. You guys remember when Franklin turned on? Uh, what did he turn on? His American Express got charged like ten thousand dollars or something. Oh, that was Defender for IoT. Yeah, was that yeah. what it was? Or something he got like whammied that? like overnight, and it was like, oh, that was a dumb idea. Yeah, yeah lucky he, he has an American like, Express yeah. black card. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> even done. Rod, I, I, your 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 video is better, um, but your oh, audio is sounding like I guess from last week. I mean, from Monday. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 
It's all you, you sounded just like you sounded just like him now. But hey, we're not going to keep our current guest in the room while we we banter back and forth. Um, so we are still in the theme of partner month, uh, and we have our next guest. This guest is very. This company is very much well known as a major player in the uh, uh, MDR and XDR, um, and they also are a front runner in the early access program for Copilot Co for Security. So we like to welcome uh, Randy Watkins from Critical Start. Welcome, Randy. Thank you, guys. I appreciate y'all having me on. Man, we appreciate you coming on. Welcome to the big house. Thank you. Hope you brought lots of cigarettes and Twinkies. That's the only currency we use here. <laughs> wow, man. I am broke. Uh, yeah, I'm broke I thought it was too. Maybe you'll take beef jerky and protein bars. Yeah, we'll do that too. Okay. I, I, I keep the yeah. shank ready. Where's my shank? It's right there. We keep, keep a shank, shank ready. Oh, yeah. Man. So, Randy, okay. Critical Start, and you are also the chief technology officer of Critical Start. That's what I'm told. Look at that with the big wigs. So, would you mind doing an introduction to our guest and by no means be shy. We want to know all about Critical Start and, and what you guys do. And then maybe we'll segue into this thing that everybody's talking about, this, this co-pilot thing. So please, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah. So it started on a, a cold winter's eve in uh, 2011. Uh, no, I mean, we Critical Start was founded in 2012. Our founder CEO, Rob Davis, was the EVP of security at RSA uh, when they had their breach. Uh, he went on the worldwide apology tour. Um, saw that uh, a lot of organizations were definitely not as secure as they thought they were and started Critical Start as a way to improve security posture. Um, that was back in 2012. We were originally a value-added reseller in the traditional sense. We were reselling security solutions, uh, and providing professional services. We got about three, four years into that, and we saw no matter what the solution was we were selling, customers couldn't operationalize it. So we looked at the space and said, well, how do we augment the shortage in both headcount and expertise to where they can really get ROI from their security investment. Uh, and the only option out there at the time was MSSPs. Mm -hmm. So we, we looked and we said, well, we need to do something. What if we did MSSP, but we actually provided value instead of taking money for nothing. Uh, and, and that's how we launched the service. A year later, Gartner decided to create a term called MDR. Uh, and, and we kind of related with that. And, uh, and that's the direction that we took it in. Uh, we started out originally integrating with uh, products that used to be best of breed, Silence, Carbon Black, Splunk, OpenDNS, long live OpenDNS. Um, and then we, we've nice. kind of slowly migrated towards what we now consider to be industry leading and best of breed, uh, really partnering, going, uh, going in with Microsoft uh, and helping customers operationalize their Microsoft investment, utilize that E5 license uh, to really measurably improve their security posture. Mm -hmm. So we uh, use APIs, we leverage Sentinel, we bring in all those alerts and then our 24 by seven staff will resolve every single alert, regardless of criticality, regardless of priority, critical high, medium, or low. We're going to resolve them all with contractual SLAs of one hour to lower that attacker dwell time and get them out of your environment as quickly as possible. That's the best pitch I've heard in the month of April. Oh, that's, pretty good. I, I, I nailed it. that's why he's the CTO. That's why he's the CTO. Now, now, before we go into all that, because that was amazing. <clears throat> We have an important question from Anton. Fender or Gibson, Randy? Ooh, uh, neither. Uh, so I <laughs> okay. play bass, um, and both Fender and Gibson are mediocre at best on bass. So I have a Music Man and a Federa, um, two dream basses that I had. Uh, I don't have a lot of money. I just spend what I have irresponsibly. So <laughs> it's, uh, Fender and Music Man, or uh, Federa and Music Man. Federa, I've heard of it. Distract from the entire point of the conversation, but that was, that was a great question. I thought it was going to spur a debate, and I loved how you went with two options off the table. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, Edward, up to you. Oh man, so once again, great pitch. I, I think I want to get me a critical start contract for just my lab. I just want to do it there. I uh, know a lot about you guys. Uh, I am surprised as I went back through all the archives. You guys have not been on the show, and I I could have I would have. I would have bet the farm that you guys had, considering how many people we know over there, both past and present, and you know um, that. Uh, we, but that's neither here nor there. You're here now, so yeah. You know, with the threat landscape being what it is, it's it's it's, it's changing. Um, it's, it's some places getting better, some places getting worse. Um, nothing seems to be off the table as far as these these advanced uh, persistent threat actors now. It, it looks like a new tool 
has come into the defenders or, or, or protectors arsenal, which is Copilot for security, you know, and it, it's an AI driven technology, incorporating machine language, uh, machine learning, and large language models with Microsoft's branding and intelligence to get it Copilot. And as we talked to um, James Key, who was the program manager at Microsoft about their front running partners, your name came up as a suggestion to have on the show, hence let's have you on the show. So is Copilot for security changing things? Is it is a very subjective question. Is, is it changing things the way security practitioners work? And is it changing things for you? And you're the CTO of this, so I'm I'm sure that this is your baby that this is happening. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty involved with it. So is it changing things? Absolutely. You talk about how um, you know AI and LLMs are contributing to Copilot. Um, it's a new tool in our arsenal. It's also a new tool in the attacker's arsenal. I mean, Chat GPT wasn't out for more than 24 hours before Bart GPT had already scanned the dark web and started writing exploit code. So it's it's definitely something that was absolutely necessary to add to our quiver to take on those uh, kind of new attacks that are coming faster, more accurately. It essentially turns anybody with an idea for a, a malicious act into a advanced attacker. Mm -hmm. So having the same thing for, uh, you know, kind of newer analysts that are coming straight out of college, straight out of high school, they want to get into cybersecurity. Um, you know, maybe they have a, a couple of certificates, they get hired into a SOC. Being able to go into Copilot and really use that as a mentor, as a guide, as a as your expert. Um, I mean, it's it's definitely going to change things. It's going to revolutionize the uh, the way that we interact with uh, alerts coming in, what we expect our analysts to do, uh, the human factor in all of it. Uh, in addition to making them more efficient and able to get through those alerts more quickly. So I've been really impressed with Copilot. Um, we started using ChatGPT right when it came out and started to see what it could do, feeding it email headers, feeding it exploit code, saying, what does this do? Feeding it just alert names and saying, what should we look for? Uh, and it, that was already powerful enough. Now you automate that with all of the telemetry that Microsoft is collecting. And man, it's already really, really good. And it's going to get better with the release of GPT-5 uh, and all the investment that Microsoft has dumped into OpenAI. So we're really looking at this as being a uh, a substantial evolution in security analytics and and really uh, our ability to defend against these attacks that are again coming hot and heavy. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. I mean, whether we're talking to previous guests on the show and probably more guests are going to come on, but I, I'm like talking to the customers now and seeing how they're how they're interacting with the product because this is something that. Um, you know, Microsoft releases a superpower to everybody. Even mm -hmm. our adversaries can, with enough stealth, can buy it. Yep. But now you've given this powerful tool to the directly to the customer, right? I, I don't think Microsoft is very much giving a particular technology to a, a service provider exclusively, mm -hmm. right? It's generally con it's consumer based, and then your companies come on and provide value, expertise, advisorship to it. It's sort of scary. I mean, you've given a, a lot, and it seems the only deterrent right now. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's going to be overcome. It's the price model. You, you can play, but it's going to cost you to play. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can play all you want, right? But once that's been figured out, the same way they figured out Microsoft Sentinel log ingestion costs, now it's not a non-factor, right? People have figured it out. So when you're, when you're looking at this innovation, wh where does your, how are you creative? You know, as a CTO and you got the tools, you got everything, you got budget, you're like, okay, I have the thing. How do you get creative to say, I'm, I, I, I want to make the best use of this, and this is how we're going to either create a new thing within, you know, CS, or this is how we're going to approve something? Because that's things I'm still scratching my bald head around that. Yeah, uh, and and it's kind of a, a little bit of both, right? I mean, you have to look at both avenues of creating something new versus improving what's there. Uh, the and Rod, I absolutely love what you're getting ready to release with the how to build a better prompt because it's all in the prompt. So we we run um, kind of internal education on how to construct better prompts, and that's going to carry through to Copilot. Now, the table stakes with Copilot is really uh, enabling analysts that you know previously may not have been able to meet that learning curve of how to utilize all the capabilities of Azure Sentinel to mm -hmm. really utilize all the capabilities of Azure Sentinel. So KQL query building, and that's table stakes. 
I mean, the alerts come in, you can kick out a KQL query to identify all the different assets that that executable has been on, what user context it's run under, uh, identify any lateral movement that's based on those executables. Um, that's improving what we already have. Mm -hmm. That's adding efficiency to the analyst. It's adding effectiveness to the analyst. It's taking somebody that, uh, you know, may not have been comfortable writing KQL queries and had to escalate that to a tier two or a tier three to write it for them. And it's really enabling them to chase down these threats to the nth degree uh, without having to reach out for additional assistance. Mm -hmm. Then you get to the build side, right? How can we build this into our platform to really capitalize on automation? Uh, how do we how do we do 90% of the job before the analyst even touches it? And that's where a little bit of supervised machine learning combined with Copilot comes in handy. Because the way our uh, the way our backend works, we have what we call our trusted behavior registry. Um, we're a security company. We had to make at least fifteen acronyms, and TBR is one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we, we build our our TBR, and essentially what that's doing is it's not identifying bad behavior; it's identifying known good behavior. And if it doesn't exactly match a known good behavior, we assume it's bad. So we treat every alert like the American justice system, but the exact opposite. Every alert is guilty until proven innocent. Mm -hmm. TBR proves it innocent. Yeah. Now, if it doesn't exactly match, we can start grabbing key value pairs, automatically populate that into a copilot query, and then push that out to either develop a KQL, run the KQL, pull back that additional information, and bake that into the alert before the analyst even has a look at it. Yeah. So we can use our automation that we built in our playbooks to activate the uh, automation and, and Copilot capabilities that Microsoft has through Sentinel and directly with Copilot to really flesh out 95% of that alert before a human has to look at it and go, okay, based on all of this, here's the verdict. Now let's take some action. Then we can use Copilot to fill that in as well, mm -hmm. right? So uh, one thing that we've seen um, Copilot and, and kind of chat GPT in general be really excellent at is feed it a uh, feed it an alert that came in and it will give you 10 different ways to stop that alert from ever showing up again. So now we're not just doing detection and response, which is a reactive control, you know, kind of looking at NIST, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, and govern. Um, detection and response, reactive, we can start protecting those assets and identifying the assets that are more vulnerable to those and really helping customers long-term improve their security posture mm -hmm. instead of just being constantly reactive to these threats. Yeah, I, I think that anybody can really understand threat intelligence can come in and use that to say, show me tactics and behaviors, not the IOCs, because if, if it's an unknown hash in one of your hash repositories virus total, you, you're not gonna get a hit. But show me behaviors that look like this, and especially if you guys do a known good. And I love the way you go a known good because very rarely is the entire enterprise compromised. So you're always going to have at least one or two things that this is a known good. This doesn't look like like that, right? Oh, you're doing it reverse way. So that's that's excellent. And to do it at scale is hard when you don't really own the life cycle or the the, the ownership of the device of a sort. You're just an overlay to the customer. But uh, that's 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 pretty good. Cool. Now we've gone through. I haven't pulled your site up on another tab yet. But uh, have you guys already started promoting Copilot yep. offerings within Critical Store? I already, looked at, already looked at that. Hey, um, yeah. But will you? Will you put Copilot for security on there? Uh, we will as soon as we figure out exactly how to deal with that pricing issue that you talked about, Edward. Because that's the yeah. that's the variable component. That's a real. Uh, it's, it's a touchy subject for service providers if we're going to use something that's associated with credits in a customer's account that they're going to have to pay for. So inevitably, mm -hmm. what the customer wants to know is how much is your service going to cost using Copilot to us? What's our Copilot cost going to be if you're using it to run queries? So we're, we're working on building in that automation, but also a way to uh, monitor how much we're using, monitor that cost expectation to the customer and figure out how we can uh, set expectations with them so they don't experience huge, huge overages because we're using the power of Copilot inside of our offering. That's going to be difficult for almost every partner, your competitors, your frenemies and everything else, because, you know, you're, you're it's, it's sort of like a threat hunting activity without valid indicators of compromise 
you're constantly doing threat hunting, saying a, a, we can't go on a a pound of a of of of, of prevent of, of of cure versus an ounce of prevention, right? Or a dollar debt. If I had to approach it in, in a manner, um, you know, would you look at it as a incident response selling motion, meaning the you know go to a customer and go the first SCU is on us, right in your environment, and then we come in and we we validate this right here, or are you you know? Because I, I do believe that some incident responders, but the bad part about that, and now as I learn more about it, that's not really an effective way because you don't have any history. It needs to run a while before he knows anything about that. So I'm really watching partners to help drive innovation on this because you got to make money, right? Yes. Writing yes. plugins is going to be the thing. Um, and and another thing I believe is going to be hard for you. When I say for you, I mean all partners, protecting your IP. So protecting our IP is almost less of a concern. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the 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 prompting for Copilot, everybody's kind of running along the same track, and occasionally there's going to be a unique idea uh, that takes everybody else a week to reverse engineer and become competitive with it. Mm -hmm. So protecting IP is is much less of a concern. Um, I, as far as the Copilot utilization goes, and, and establishing costs and how do we kind of balance that. Um, Working with James is great, and and maybe there is a way where you know the the service provider can have their own bucket that we can apply to different customers before we utilize their bucket. Mm -hmm. uh, we also do like for Sentinel, we like you said, we face the same problem. All data should go into Sentinel, but we charge based on the data real time. Uh, and and a lot of customers had a problem with the predictability. Well, we turned around and we created cost ingest analysis to say, hey, every month we're going to go in and look at what your expectation for Sentinel costs are and what your uh, actual uh, Sentinel costs are. And we're going to identify why it's higher or lower. You know, maybe your network admin turned on debug logs on your firewall and now you just spiked through the roof. Let's dial that back and really focus on the logs that we need. There's a potential to do the same thing for Copilot. Right. And maybe it's like, hey, under certain conditions with certain alerts, we're going to run these Copilot queries to identify these different things, the approximate cost based on the volume of these alerts is gonna be X, right? So there's there's a lot of uh, thought processes going on in the back end. People a lot smarter than I am thinking through how do we really use this and operationalize it without uh, you know either creating anxiety at the customer or creating overages at the customer. Yeah. Well, there's a couple, couple things I think immediately you can think of from a cost savings, right? If you develop prompt books for the customer, right? So they have, they use something that's a quantified result. Um, what's the other thing? Oh, using my sessions or at least my sessions, the cast sessions within the last period of time. The other thing, and I think you kind of hit on it there, is to look at, do kind of that monthly cost basis to determine what they're actually using. And unfortunately right now, there's nothing we can do to identify who's doing what at the moment, except for the sessions. But I think eventually you'll be able to see who's asking stupid questions because it's an AI. Yes. You want to eventually go in and see if this copilot for security thing and can, you know, add two plus two. Well, that costs like 0 0.01, but it still costs something, right? So it does all that stuff, but it's it's intended for security purposes. Yeah, yeah. stupid I like, questions I like is definitely... I'm oh, sorry, oh. Randy, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, stupid questions is definitely something that's that's on our radar. We have a little bit of a benefit in the fact that we've built a uh, a front end. Our platform is called Core, the Security Operations Risk and Response Platform, mm -hmm. and that's where our analysts work out of. It's transparent to the customer, 100%. They can see everything we do, and it's all uh, bi-directional sync with Sentinel. But using that as the front end. We can see who's asking stupid questions and how much they're costing customers, right? Because an analyst runs a, a co-pilot prompt from core. We're going to log that prompt. We're going to log the cost of it. We're going to log the results of it. We're going to cache all that internally. So we will be able to uh, at least see who the more heavy users of co-pilot are uh, and what kind of prompts they're running. And then we also have a mechanism uh, called event hints where depending on the alert that comes in, we can give the analysts some idea of what to do so we can take some guidance from your presentation on how to build better co-pilot queries and say hey in this scenario you're going to want to you know make sure you capture this this and this and then specify that you want to run from this user context so we do have a couple of ideas around that as well yeah I, I, you gave me a you gave me a, a awesome idea though by the way I, 
So we got. I talked about golden prompts. I'm going to have a section just on stupid prompts. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do this. Yeah. Equally yeah. as important. Don't run a single faceted prompt. Show me every uh, every network connection across my entire environment. That's going to cost you some money. <laughs> yeah, and 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 and, and, and the sub theme is it, if you look at the way Copilot is, if I had to translate this into a traditional, you know, occupation, do you want to question like a lawyer or do you want to question like an interrogator? Yeah, but they're very different. Right. And it, it, and you can force you can yeah, I write that down, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because lawyers be they ask these questions to get you to to give up more information that they really want that they doing it. Interrogator asks you the question as though they already know the answer. Yeah. Right. Now weren't you at the scene of the murder at eleven thirty two with a knife in your hand and uh you were standing six feet over the body? <laughs> yeah, but now I'm now I'm kind of hesitant with that. I may have to wipe that out because um, the interrogator, they are trying to manipulate the response, and we don't want we don't want to manipulate the response. We want an we want an accurate response. We just want to ask the right question. Or maybe like some sort of check, like Copilot's like, oh hey, that question's a heavy question. Are you sure you want to ask it? I was That'd thinking cool. that too. Yeah, saying right. hey, based on previous sessions, you've asked this question before with an average return time of two minutes. Do you want to ask that question again? <laughs> uh, no. Something, by the way. Still yeah, kind of kind of <laughs> takes me back to Tanium days, where depending on what you were looking for, you could get an answer really quick. You could break your entire network. No one knows. It's kind of a roll of the dice. Uh, <laughs> having some sort of safety check somewhere in there uh, may not be a bad idea. Uh, like, are you sure you want to do this? And then if it's a really dumb question, are you really sure you want to do that? <laughs> Last it, chance. Yeah. Ooh, I just shade throw that tanium. <laughs> Mike, you going to take that? <laughs> right. That was, a good, that was good shade. That was good shade. That was good Randy, shade. I was going to say earlier, I, I like the approach. Like, let's just do let's just do some pattern matching here. Like, okay, the month and the life of X customer. What is everybody's going to be different, right? So anyone, it's really hard to like nail that down between like, well, tell me exactly how much it's going to be. Like, well, it depends, right? Everyone's favorite consulting answer. You are going to have ultimately probably a completely different experience than even maybe another organization in your same sector with a similar seat count, just dependent on all kinds of different factors. So it's never, a, it's, you can't almost give a static price model anymore. It has to be based on learning the patterns and the flow uh, and the day-to-day -day of that org. And then maybe after the fact, like, okay, here's, here's what we've seen. Maybe to your point, you can use your service to help improve which I think is a fantastic service. And then that's it's an estimate, right? It's an estimate. It's it's a, it's a tough thing to nail down. I, I, I tell you something that if you think about, about the way humans think as far as improvement that is quantifiable, but not really rooted in actual progress, the minute you go with a, a the ability to improve your secure score, then all bets are all people going to want their secure score. Damn the cost of the SEU. My secure score has to be up more. And just think about when you, you, you look at that, maybe create a secure score for that, uh, for, for Copilot for security, where your score gets better as the prompt uh, result times come in shorter, but you, you get more relevant results. You have to gamify it a little bit, but there's no gamification of it right now. It gives you have a user efficiency score, right? Uh, and then give badges for for people that meet certain uh, certain criteria. Like, man, you've resolved a hundred alerts by using a dollar fifty in Copilot charges yeah. that only took three seconds total to return. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. that actually. Uh, people yeah. want that. Well, I, mean, I would think people would want that. Like, I would want regular feedback. Like, hey, by the way, here's that way that you can use me better. I mean, what a, <laughs> and, what a, what a fantastic solution. And, and, and me being the Microsoft salesperson that. Brody accusing me to be, I would definitely go into Azure and have the secure score. Your secure score can be improved 100 points by implementing, you know, Copilot for security and buying 100 SEUs. Now, <laughs> you get a point for donor. SEU. <laughs> now, here's something that we thought about internally, and this is a like a, almost a philosophical question, is what we don't want to do is solve problems that Copilot's going to solve for us about Copilot. So we, <laughs> right. we talk about expensive prompts. How long is it going to be until Microsoft goes, we rewrote the prompt to be more efficient and return the actual results, right? I mean, it's it's a short period of time. So it's it, right. we're really trying to pick and choose the problems that we solve that we see being a long-term problem and not try to focus on something where we're like, man, the next iteration of Copilot, this whole, this whole thing's going to be moot. There's no sense in, in coding around it. Right. Well, when, when like you said five or whatever they're going to call it, you know, comes out, it'll be 
presumably more efficient, yada yada. So the, everything will change, and maybe maybe we don't have a rod SCU burn discussion, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're gonna get me in trouble. You're gonna get rod in trouble again, <laughs> um, and I'm not bailing him out this time. Um, right. But your job as the CTO and your peers are going to be the hardest, Randy, because you have to look at the present, but you have to have the ability to look down the road to say, innovations are going to come. How do I stay relevant, but at the same time stay, you know, in the know what, what is the current capability of it and predict it? Because unless you own the tech, are you closest to the tech ownership of it? It can be in that mind share. You're, you're still guessing, right? Now, is there anything of technology insider trading? Probably closer you are to Microsoft, maybe a little bit more you get. But I, you know, they, it goes back to the question: How do you stay innovative? How do you stay creative when you see these things, but you don't own the tech? And it sounds like you got a really good handle on. Hey, I have an idea, and then this is what you do. Because eventually, you're going to learn a lot on other people's dime. It just happens that way, right? The front runners are the ones that go out. We used to call them beta testers. Yep. <laughs> now yep. we call them customers. And that's the idea is right now. Right? Early adopters. Early adopters. Yeah, early that's adopters. That's what it is. Uh, you you bring up a good point about you know how do you stay innovative? How do you stay kind of um, uh, looking forward? And I, the biggest thing for me is it's not a one person job. I, and we have a, a team of people that participated in private preview. Um, we we involved a bunch of different functions. It wasn't just myself and product management. It was also our SOC. We bring in a lot of our our senior analysts, junior analysts. Um, folks that are actually going to use it. We talk to customers. Uh, I mean, Microsoft has been very um, forward in approaching customers about Security Copilot. And anytime they bring it up, I'll interrupt the conversation and say, what would you use this for? Uh, and, and just start getting their ideas. And if they have a good idea, then, I mean, that's a problem that we can solve too. So it's really uh, about getting a, a collective of more perspective than just one person. Yeah. You know, and, and oftentimes that's a very viable way to put everybody into the room to have these focus and brainstorm groups. But this is one of those things that you, you have to be careful because what if you get co-pilot envy like certain people in your organization? Like, well, I want to use co-pilot. How come you're not letting me do it, right? I want I want to learn this yeah. too. And and uh, I've been reluctant to really get into the place where I have a limited, literally one SCU. I say, I'm not going to mess this up. When I get in here, I'm going to be very deliberate about what I'm going to use it for to try to learn as much as I can because I get not a blank check here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you guys have always been one of the top SDR, MDRs, um, MSSPs, and I changed the P. I don't say provider. I say partner. You guys have really been go. talked about as a partner, not a provider. And that's good because we got a lot of MSSPs who are not. They're just providers, and they're, and they're not really providing service, and they're definitely mm -hmm. not providing partnership, right? I want someone to go down in flames with me. If I go down, you're going down too. Yep. So, yeah, you, I'm not going. To, yeah, everybody's going down. Yeah. Nobody gets off the Titanic. Everybody goes <laughs> down. Just stay with me. Um, it, it, Edward it, has it, no lifeboats. So. No lifeboats. <laughs> Cut them off a long time ago. There's a lot. There. Um, let me ask this question of you. Um, you can't hyper focus on this. There are other things to do. Correct. How do you balance that? Because you got other th you, there, there are other innovation vehicles that Cobalt has nothing to do with that still can be solved without this AI stuff. Are you are you being able to balance your attention to say, hey, these are things that we've thrown a lot of money and a lot of human capital behind, and there's still huge, you know, revenue and innovation opportunities, and I still got to do this thing. Are you balancing that pretty well? Oh yeah, yeah. We have uh, we develop Tiger teams for things that pop up like uh, Microsoft Private Previews. Uh, like unified, uh, the unified console, we have a tiger team for that. Copilot, we stand up a tiger team for that. And then there's our our actual product teams that focus on other services that we're trying to release. You know, vulnerability prioritization, asset management, uh, risk assessment modules. We've really been expanding the breadth. And you talk about um, MSSPs. Uh, we really seen uh, seen those in the earlier days as uh, you know a vehicle to a checkbox of compliance. Uh, but mm -hmm. not providing values. Then MDR came along and provided value around detection and response. And now the, the market's kind of looking at MDRs to expand their services to replace MSSPs while still providing the value. So we have a lot of different things going on at the exact same time while still trying to innovate on the MDR front. And for the love of God, keep up with Microsoft. <laughs> I mean, 
we don't have $10 billion to invest year over year in security, but you guys just release product after product and feature after feature that we have to keep up on. So there is a, 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 a kind of a high wire that we're walking, um, you know, trying to keep all of those different priorities and projects balanced while still keeping up with customer demand for additional features and functionality that Microsoft is putting out. So we got Defender for Server, Defender for Containers. Um, you know, there's new capabilities that just came out in Defender for Identity. We have the insider risk management piece coming out that's built into Sentinel. So it's, it is a lot, but we do that with uh, very targeted teams that have very specific things that they're looking into. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we do kind of agile release cycles to get those features and functionalities out as quickly as possible. Yeah. And it's hard for security operations to adhere to that type of framework with these two, you know, two week sprints, right? Uh, assuming. And the other thing is, you know, nobody will say it, but Copilot for security may not be right for every customer, right? It, 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 it may not be the thing that immediately at that moment in time, it may not be right for them, right? Because That's fair. if you look at their, you know, risk exposure and, and, and posture, nobody's doing it 100% right because security is not static, right? If you stay static, the CVE will catch up with you. <laughs> It'll catch up with you eventually, right? So you have to, you know, customers are having to watch what their peers are doing. And I still don't see this a lot. And, 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 it's, and, and it's disappointing. A lot of industries still don't collaborate because there's some shame to saying you've been breached. Right or or compromise, which is the more intelligence. I wasn't hacked. I was compromised. Shit, you were hacked. Um, and 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 that would greatly improve it. But they're relying on vendors a lot when there should be a lot of peer exchange. It's like, hey man, don't let this, don't be next. Don't let this happen to you, and be able to do those things. So it's we are all got jobs for a while, even with this AI stuff, right? Until AI decides to replace us, we won't have jobs when AI decides you're no longer needed, right? Because we have to feed it. And, and and they want to be fed. Um, they want to be fed. What was, what was that? What was that movie? The Shop of Horrors. Feed me. Well, uh, see little more. Shop of Horrors. Yeah, a little Shop of Horrors. Yeah, but a, but a killer plant. That's AI. actually a great soundtrack to that movie too. All oh, the whole soundtrack is pretty good. Yeah, they are old. I am old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am old. I'm I'm, um, I'm happy that somebody gets that. So. I actually yeah, got nice. I got a something stacked up in my basement on two three com uh super swat stacks uh switches from back in the day or hubs or whatever downstairs um uh, so one more thing randy we're going to be res respectable of your time um you know how do you we, we got all this learning we got one of the masses of creating content and learning right here how do you navigate through the minutia to be able to do these things where if Rod wasn't creating a workshop for better prompts, not good prompts, how do, you, do you have a director or training of someone that comes in and say, hey, this is going to be the most effective to us because you, you got to cycle guys through learning, right? Because if, I, if I'm sitting here and I'm doing the, the good work and I see my peer over here and he's getting to play with the shiny toys, I'm going to give him a side eye. So yeah. how do you how do you rotate? I want to understand your, your learning path to be able to do it. Yeah, so we, we uh, uh, learning is something we have a, a very, a very strong focus on internally. We have three or four different folks that are dedicated to uh, learning and education and different functions throughout the organization. So there's like kind of the sales and pre-sales aspect of it. And then there's the uh, kind of just leadership and growth aspect of it that's run by a different team. Uh, and then in the SOC, uh, we actually develop and run our own training. So before an analyst ever becomes a tier one analyst, it's three months of training and they learn everything from OSI model to TTPs to alert resolution mm -hmm. to become a tier one. Then there's a training path to get to a tier two. Then there's a training path to move up and out into the organization. So you can go up to a tier three, you can go into pre-sales, post-sales, you can go into, um, uh, you know, instant response or pen testing and do internships there. But we do develop our own training internally. Uh, and we have somebody who uh, kind of revises that after every analyst class we bring through. So once we start kind of getting our, our hands wrapped around how we're going to leverage Copilot, we can bake that into the training. And that just becomes part of our rhythm uh, in educating the new analysts that are coming in. 
Perfect. So uh, the the fact that we've always had this in-house developed training program really just sets the precedence of you will continue learning and we're going to make sure that we're putting the most relevant stuff in front of you. So example, I led throughout the organization multiple classes on how to use chat GPT to accomplish your job. And I did that with multiple functions, whether it was marketing, sales, pre-sales, SOC, mm -hmm. uh, onboarding and implementation. And man, Rod, a lot of what I did was how to build better prompts. Um, a yep. lot of people use it like an advanced Google. And I have prompts that are thousands of words long. That's it. See, people have gotten in this really bad habit of like mm -hmm. sticking like three or four unconnected words in a search engine, but then they have to spend the time they're on like five different pages to find exactly what it is they want. Right. So instead, it's going back to just standard conversation because it's natural language. People forget that I can actually ask a question and, and ask it, and it. Pretend you're talking to a person. Right. Hey, imagine giving them some search engine term. You know, yeah, just well, that's how well, you but, talk back and forth. But that's the technology, right? We all learned yeah. like, okay, I need the keywords. So the yeah. algorithm gets me the article of the yes. 10 year old thing I'm trying to solve. We have to go back to how we wanted to treat the internet back in like the 90s and stuff, where yeah. it's like, oh, hello, Ask Jeeves. This yeah. is what I want, right? Yeah. You know, like, that's, that's what we got to go back to. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, it, it went from uh, like uh, just searching those keywords back to verbosity. I and mean, it's not act like you're talking to one person. I, my most effective prompts, I, the whole first paragraph is creating a team. I know like I, I code through chat GPT and my first chunk is you are a development team. Yes. You consist mm -hmm. of an engineer, you consist of a QA, you consist of a, like, and, and then you talk to the team and you give them the problem. And it's, it's funny because if you just run the chat or, or you run the prompt kind of silent, you get the output. But if you include at the end, let me know all your crosstalk you will see every one of them talking to each other. And the engineer says this, and then the developer says this, and then QA says, you're all stupid. You need to rewrite this into three lines of code here. So, I, I mean, I have a lot of fun with chat GPT. I mean, uh, used it to build scavenger hunts for the kids, used it to build mm -hmm. car routes for vacations, used it to build an Outlook plugin to automatically schedule my flights. Um, it's, it's a really uh, uh, kind of functional thing. And your, your imagination is what limits you. And Copilot is really the same way. You're an incident response team. You you consist of an analyst, an incident response engineer, and a forensics expert. Make sure you're capturing things in a way that can be court admissible. And the, those prompts can be built out in extreme verbosity, uh, and you can really drive a lot of uh, uh, very valuable results out of it. Yeah. Am I, Mr. Um, Edward, sorry, I got to tell Randy, you just blew my mind because I have been giving Copilot or GPT a persona Right. I've been yeah. giving it like this is you and this is what we want to accomplish. And here's what I need from you. But I've never given it a team's persona with different perspectives and the crosstalk. Yeah, you just blew my mind. I'm going to changing how I prompt forever. Thank you. Do you, yep. do you yeah, I, I, thank Congratula you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy I could occupy your weekend. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> and, and, but it sort of upends what I, the, the, what I thought was a clever comment of prompt like a investigator rather than a lawyer but now I'm, I'm sort of rethinking that i think it's a little bit yeah. of both because if i had to go back i would i would ask you know members of the jury there you, you have go. seen the evidence and you've seen this right here and i provided this by so and so and here's the irrefutable artifacts as given to me by the investigator on the scene what would you conclude is the actual blah 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 given that you've had all of this over a three-month period of time so that's actually pretty cool. I see you writing that down, Rod. Write that down. Um, oh, I'm writing something else here. <laughs> like, you, you are prolific today. I, I love the Copilot Envy thing. That, I'm going to use that. Yeah, well, I took my ADD drugs today, so I'm good. Yeah. Um, and uh, this, this is, this is, this is good. You're, you're, you're winning. So you, you, you currently get the belt for the rest of the month until somebody else can up in Critical Star. Yeah. Rest of the partners be jealous. Yeah, Prompt like go. no one is watching. Yeah, kind of like the dance <laughs> thing. Like nobody's watching. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Watkins, thank you so much. I, I feel like this thank conversation you. was very, you know, personal. Like I said, I'm surprised we didn't have you guys on the show. I think there was some just scheduling thing. But thanks for coming on here. Uh, you are the guest. You get to have all the closing remarks. Go ahead and, and pump your company up. And what 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 do you want to ask? You know, the Microsoft Insight Security Copilots because we're copilots. You know, what do you what do you want to ask? Them? We'll give an answer. Uh, what do I want to ask you guys? Or what do you want to tell us? 
Just Hold on. Uh, well, I know if um, I, I so I'll say this: Critical Start supports uh, products outside of Microsoft, and by far the biggest wave that we see is Splunk, CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, all those customers wanting monitoring, but they want to move to E5. So they don't want a gap in coverage and they need to get to the E5. We can come in, take over that environment, help them migrate and help them get full utilization of Defender for Identity, Defender for Office, Defender for Cloud Apps, Defender for Endpoint, and really get them from best of breed to best of portfolio in a way that makes sense and utilizes ESIF dollars. So we are fast track and ESIF approved. We're in all the different um, programs for CSI so we can do workshops. If, the, if you need anything, whether it's just a sounding board for your Microsoft implementation, you need a 24 by seven MDR provider, you want an MDR provider that's gonna have accountability with contractual SLAs resolving every alert, check out Critical Start. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, you guys have a really good history before you threw all, you know, went all in on Microsoft that you you touched a lot of products. You you were channel partners, gold, platinum, diamond for a lot of technology. So you 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 have the scars, right? This is this yeah. is not academic. You guys are proving yourself out in the field, and 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 so you you have an approach of understanding what the failures are. And don't yeah, and so it, we've been partners with Microsoft since Microsoft was the punchline to the joke of security. <laughs> And we've I seen, remember those days, the pie in the face at the courthouses. Oh my yeah. God. The little yeah. uh the little arm that comes down to block you from going around, but you can see all the tire tracks in the snow going around <laughs> the little guard. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it was uh I mean, it was a, a an eye opener when we actually tested uh Defender ATP and saw the amount of visibility that it had and the potential that was there because it's Microsoft. And then to see the advancements and evolutions in Defender for Identity, hands down the most valuable Defender, aside from Endpoint and the entire stack, Defender for Identity saves bacon. Yes. So, I mean, whatever we can do to get customers converted over to that stack where mm -hmm. it's true XDR. And I did a podcast a long time ago. I used to host my own called Son of a Breach. And I talked to Ann Johnson about your definition of XDR. And to this day, I still think Microsoft is not only the best executioner of what true XDR is, but the only executioner of what true XDR is. Yeah. So we're leaning in. We know how to use it. We're experts at it. And we're happy to help other customers really uh, consolidate their security portfolio into a simplified architecture that is effective and efficient at stopping breaches. Yeah. And you, you said something, you know, you were saying that MDI is, you know, We'll save your bacon. You're right, right? Um, short of turning off AD, you, you're asking for it. Because <laughs> right. I, I, I live off the land now. PowerShell and WMI. You Amen. won't see me. You won't see me coming. Uh, you, you know, and I, and once I get your hashes, I own you. All your hashes belong to us. Yeah, and, and you know we'll that you. all those other you. security tools can also use Copilot for security. What I think they have like what's it, Betty or or Loretta? What's the name of that AI that they have? I don't know. Uh, no idea. Yeah, and, and and you're gonna see a resurgence of a one that was once my favorite product and will probably come back, which is Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. Watch it. Watch what it oh, does yeah. when it starts looking at behavior patterns. Because yeah. the worst thing you can happen is not have application governance and someone download a payload of AI application into your environment. Not well, not download it because you don't download in traditional sense of SaaS. But once they've passed those creds and start doing user like APIs, you know, inquiries. At, and then they start escalating because I can steal your session, your token, reroute you. I got you, right? That's that's all the toehold you're going to need. And so <laughs> the Fender for Cloud apps is going to come back around and MDI <laughs> will save your, your your hash. It will save yeah. your hash. <laughs> Never mind that. Just like Active Directory is not going away anytime soon. That's why you need MDI. Net, net. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's the deal. It's, it's, yeah. It's stuck. Yeah. Well, there are some rarities where you're seeing people that have decided we're going to stay up here, but that's 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 a that's a business decision because you got to force the legacy apps out, and you have to make yeah. it very cognizant. Your 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 technology officer has to say we're going to modernize. And, and here's just my gonna... massive budget to do so. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and you don't have to eliminate Active Directory. You have to minimize the attack exposure on how you rely on these things, right? And it's just it's just 
administrators get you hacked because they're 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 RDPing over to stuff. Admins. And, and and they're leaving they're 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 leaving our artifacts inside you know, uh, 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 on the machines that they they that they remoted to to do it rather than doing PowerShell invoke sessions right. Look how smart session. you are after reading all that. Yeah, you, you should. You yeah. need to take that test really quick. Yeah, <laughs> take that test really already quick. so you can get the creds. Man, uh, it's been awesome, man. It's been really great talking with you. You're obviously passionate and knowledgeable what you do, and just the way you describe your training program and and how you want to work with customers, it's. Uh, it's, it's been a very, uh, it's been an enlightening conversation getting to know you and, and I'd like to look more into Critical yeah. Start because of this. So thank you for the time today. Yeah, thank hey, you thank so you much. Guys. I appreciate really the, uh, the laid back but informative uh, informative show you all are putting on. It's uh, it's refreshing. So I, I appreciate the conversation. Anytime you guys want me back on, just let me know. I'll clear my schedule for you. Man, we'll appreciate yeah. that. You want to come right. on and host a little bit too? So Rod and all, all this can take some. He's an old podcaster. He knows how to do this. He knows hey, how I, to do this. Sure. I, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm listening to Son of a Breach because someone said it on, on our show. I was like, let me go hear about this. Big yeah. shout out to Ann Johnson. Come back on the show, Ann. We miss you. Yeah, friend of the show. <laughs> friend of the show. Thanks, everyone. Hey, anytime you guys need me to pinch hit, I'm happy to. Awesome. We'll hold you to it. We'll hold you Thanks, to guys. It. All right. Take care, bud. Have a good Have one. Have a good one. Bye-bye.